It is Wednesday afternoon. I believe it's February 17th. If not, I'm awfully close to the right date. Okay. And we are continuing our study in the Millennial Kingdom. The beginning might be a slight review, but we're looking at, at the characteristics, I'll call it, of what the Millennial Kingdom is like. And what I want to bring to our mind, we've talked about how he, Messiah Yeshua Jesus is King of Kings. That means there are other kings, or he wouldn't be king over kings, but we know he is the king. We know no one sits equal with him. They're all under him. When we're talking about who's ruling with him, we're talking about here on earth. We know, we looked, I do remember that we looked at Revelation 20, uh, 19 before that we come back with him when he stops the battle of Armageddon, and that this is the time when he sets up rule and we're there to rule with him. We'll look at that again in just a moment, but right now we're going to see that it does mention if you've got a king and he has sons, you have princes. And we do read that in at least the King James Version. You may have a different word. Actually, in the Jewish Bible also, complete Jewish Bible, you have it. Um, the word princess. You may have officials. I'm speaking of Yeshia, Isaiah, chapter 32, and verse 1. Behold, a king will reign righteously, and princes will rule justly. And like I said, if you have officials, you go back a little further in the, the language and you find the word princess there. And the idea is that there are others that he gives rule to, that he delegates out authority. We see he taught that all the way through scripture, that he taught it for the nation of Israel, taught Moshe to have those he could delegate to. And we even see it in our called out assembly, our churches today, that, that the pastor was not to be caught up in the details of other things. He was to have elders who are wise men of God, who would take care of the needs of the flock, that the pastor could stay in study of the word and in prayer to feed the flock. So we see that, that he's just putting into effect on earth what he's taught all along in his way of ruling. So we know that, that he is the king that reigns righteously. No other king ever has, no other king ever would, but we know Yeshua will forever. And then his princes, because they're under his power and authority, and we who come back have our new bodies, so we have our mind like Messiah, are able to rule justly also. It's not going to be out of order. You know, the people who are living on this earth who are going to need a judge, they're not going to go before that judge and come away saying, that was a bad judgment call. No, everything will be done justly and righteously, even when they don't see Messiah as the one that they come before, you know, because their problem isn't on that level, you know, or in that place. Let's look now quickly at Revelation chapter 5. And if you don't want to flip around quickly, I'll read everything for you that I'm talking about or give you a chance to write down the references for later. Chapter 5 and verse 10 Chapter 5 is telling us, I have to back up to uh, verse 8, has that he's taken the scroll. This is Messiah, the Lamb, took the scroll from Jehovah the Father who was sitting on the throne. Remember, they have a love seat built for two. It's a throne for two, for, for Jehovah, God the Father, and for Yeshua, the Son, the Lamb of God, who looked as if he'd been slain, but has now risen to be the lion of the tribe of Judah, showing his power and his authority. So when he took that scroll, the four living creatures who were there to worship and honor our God, they fell down in worship. And then it says that the 24 elders who represent us, that they fell down and they're worshiping before the Lamb, and they're singing a new song saying that, that only the Lamb was worthy to take that scroll. Remember, he bought back planet earth he bought back humanity he brought us back he redeemed us by his shed blood he had to become human to redeem humanity so he is the only one who is worthy who was able and he is uh he's purchased a people for himself from every tribe every language every people every nation so this isn't just for the jewish people this is for believers whether you're Jewish or Gentile, the key is you are a believer. You have put your faith in Yeshua, Jesus, and his shed blood. Knowing that, then verse 10 makes sense. You, God, have made them, the believers, into a kingdom of priests to our God. Okay, priests are doing what? 
They're representing God to the people. They're representing the people to God. So when Messiah is sitting on the throne, he still has his priests who are still being his representatives, his ambassadors. They're going out to do his work. I'm sure they're going to the areas that God has given them that language for. You're not going to send one who speaks Chinese to the Philippines. You're going to send one who speaks, and I slaughter, I don't say it right, to, to God. To God. Okay, Rowena, pop in here. Lita. I always want to say tag along, and I know that's wrong. <laughs> say it right for me, one of you two, please. Rowena's trying. trying. Excuse me. You're still you're still muted. <clears throat> I should have picked a language I could have said. Thank you. Okay, I'm not even I'm not even gonna to try to repeat, but you get my point. God's got representatives going to all areas where all hear and all understand. And here in verse 10, you've made them these priests and they will reign where? Upon the earth. They're not going to go up into the heavens and reign in the heavens. They're going to reign on the earth. So I fully believe, just like we saw, God gave Shaul Paul a background and used every bit of that background in the ministry he gave him to do. Let me take it into modern time. And I will say humbly, and I mean it very humbly, but God has given me, uh, he's called me into ministry. He gave me a background for that ministry. He gave me a Jewish background, so he called me to a Jewish ministry. That's just common sense. You just see it, but I see it on the grander scale where the Lord will still be using what he's given people because there are going to be people living on this earth who need guidance, who need wisdom, who need the representative to come and help straighten them out in, in that area. And he's going to send people that, well, the ones that we're talking about here are the, the, the saints that have been given their new bodies and are able to go out and minister for the Lord. Look at chapter 20 of Revelation and verse 6. This might help us also. Chapter 20 and verse 6. And we read there, Blessed and holy is the one who has a part in the first resurrection. Okay, remember the first resurrection? We saw some resurrected after Yeshua raised from the dead. We see them resurrected at the time of rapture. We see the, um, the third phase was at... Um, Oh, was before they go into the millennium, we see the, the ones, the tribulation saints raised because we're told that those who were beheaded for their faith during the tribulation would rule and reign with him. So there's our three phases. They are blessed because the second death has no power. That's the death that sends them into the lake of fire. Remember, born twice, die once. Born once, die twice, physically and spiritually. But for the one who believes who is born again, then we only, the physical may die, but the spiritual lives on in service unto the Lord. Okay, and these who the second death doesn't touch, the being cast into hell will not touch, they will be priests of God. I got to sneeze. Sorry. <laughs> priests of God and priests of Messiah. They're Kohanim in my complete Jewish Bible. They will be priests for him, will reign with him for a thousand years. If it's saying a thousand years, we pretty well know that's our millennial time. So now we have princes. We have us. We have priests. Let me show you we have priests from the Old Testament time, the original covenant time, Yeshia, Isaiah chapter 61. Isaiah 61. <laughs> if you're hearing a thump, it's the dog's tail, and Roger is doing everything to stop the tail from going. <laughs> but she's so excited to see somebody that she's not cooperating, and I'm laughing because they are trying so hard to, to stop the tail, <laughs> the happy ending. Anyway, I, had to, I thought in case of it's being picked up on uh, equipment, I better explain. Yeshia, Isaiah 61, 6. But you will be called the priests of the Lord. You will be spoken of as ministers of our God, and you will eat the wealth of nations, and you will boast in their riches. <laughs> when will Israel's priests be able to, to eat the wealth of other nations and boast in their riches? Only when they're raised up to be head nation, and the Gentile nations are below them. And that's fulfilled only in the millennial time. Right now we're in Gentile world rule, and we know we will be until Messiah returns and sets up his throne, earthly throne, then Israel is lifted up because that's where Messiah is. 
We also have shepherds ruling during the millennium, and we see that in Jeremia, the very next book, Jeremiah chapter 23. Jeremiah chapter 23, we're going to look at verses 2 through 4. Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 2. Therefore, this is what the Lord, what Adonai, the God of Israel, says concerning the shepherds who are tending my people. Okay, he's calling them my people. Now, you have scattered my flock and driven them away and have not been concerned about them. He's telling the shepherds that, that you've caused this to come on them you've, and you've not been concerned about them. Behold, I'm going to call you to account for the evil of your deeds, declares the Lord. Those shepherds who were false shepherds, who were false leaders, who did not lead them in the right way of faith, God's going to hold them responsible for the flock that they led astray. This is not... Uh, they don't get off easy. Anyone who's teaching and handling, who is representing God and his word, it's a high responsibility, and God takes it very seriously. And anyone in that position should also. Verse 3, Then I, God, Adonai is speaking, I the Lord, God myself, I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries where I've driven them. How has he driven them? It, because they were rebellious, he allowed them to go into captivity. Captivity, not everybody came back home to Israel. So they stayed scattered. And we have Jews scattered all over the face of the world today because somewhere in the line there was not the faithfulness to God. So he allowed them to, to be scattered. But he promises, I'll bring them back to their pasture. I will bring them back to Israel. They will be fruitful and multiply. I will also raise up shepherds over them, and they will tend them. They will not be afraid any longer, not be terrified, nor will any be missing. None missing. Right now, Israel has sheep missing. They're outside of where they should be. God will bring them all back into the land he promised them and set up over them shepherds who will guide them. Shepherds who will shepherd them and take care of them. These will be the good shepherds. And if it's a time when they will no longer be terrified or, or afraid or missing or lost, we know that that can only be fulfilled in millennial time. That up until then, there's not a chance for that. They're scattered everywhere until that point. So we've got princes and priests. We've got ourselves. We've got other raised from... Um, you know, they, they've lived before and been raised from original covenant times all the way through tribulation times. We also see that God puts judges up during the millennium. This is Yeshia. Go back to Isaiah 26 and verse 1. Sorry, let's go 1 verse 26. Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 26. I'm dyslexic today. Okay, Isaiah, or Yeshahu, actually when I say his name the whole way, the right way, often I short it, we'll call him Izzy. How's that? Okay, <laughs> chapter 1 and verse 26. Then I will restore your judges as at first, your counselors as at the beginning, and that you will be called the city of righteousness, a faithful city. When will Jerusalem be called a city of righteousness, a faithful city? Only when her, her Lord is sitting on his throne and ruling righteously, then the city will be faithful to their God, and they, they will be this example. And at this that's time, in the that's in the millennium. So at this time then, they have counselors and they have judges. So the earthly people are still going to have needs. They're still going to need guidance. They're still going to need judges. God's going to see to it they have righteous and just and right judges and princes and priests and shepherds. I mean, he's tending to them beautifully. And his very own Talmudim, the disciples who followed Yeshua, Matthew, Mattathiah, we're going to go to Matthew 19. Matthew 19 and verse 28. And there we read, when I get there, there we read, and Yeshua said to them, Truly I say to you, that you who have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, when this world is, is, is enjoying its regeneration, it's been regenerated, it's been brought back into a more beautiful state, when the Son of Man, Messianic title, this is Yeshua Jesus and no other, 
will sit on his glorious throne. And we know from 2 Shmuel chapter 7, this is David's throne. Where did he rule? Jerusalem. What place did God put his name on? Jerusalem. So we know, Son of Man will sit on his throne in Jerusalem. When he's sitting there, it says, You also, and he's talking to those twelve that, that followed him, You also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And in just a little bit, we're going to find that each tribe is given a partial a part of the land of Israel. Just like when they went into the promised land the first time, and it was divided, this area was was up, the farthest up north was Don, you call him Dan, and you saw each tribe got a portion of land. We're going to see that there's a repeat of that, of course, much more land, because it's a, a it's huge. It's going to take in Egypt. It's, well, there's some of Egypt, because there's still a nation called Egypt, but some of it. Some southern of where Israel is now. Northern Lebanon, Syria, Iran, and even into Iraq. It's going to go all the way to the Euphrates River. It's going to go down to the Nile River. All of that's going to be Israel in the millennial time. And all of these then will be ruling in different areas. And I think because each one is ruling over his tribe, that he will be in that area where his tribal people are. <clears throat> Makes sense. In other words, he won't send Naphtali to uh, Judah, and he won't send Benjamin to Ashur. He'll give them their own um, people to, you know, to uh, rule over. Is that a question? That is a question. Maria? We're trying. We're trying. No, I, there you uh, go. It, You're in. I know it was Ma uh, Matthew 17, uh, 19, 28 that you, that you read. Yes. But which was that the previous? Oh, the previous verse that I read about the judges was Isaiah 1, 26. Oh, 26. Yes. I, was, I, was, I, I didn't hear the 20, and I was reading 6, and it, it makes no oh. sense. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad that you said it. So, yeah. Hope, Thank you. You're welcome. Hopefully that makes it clear on the, the recording too, uh, especially since I said the wrong reference the first time. Isaiah 1, 26. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I got to think. I got to reverse it. I give up. Hopefully you got it. Israel during this time, as I've said repeatedly, is the head nation with Jerusalem as the capital, not because that's Rochelle's desire, although honestly it is, <laughs> but it's because God said it, because God put it there in his plan. Let's go back to our original covenant uh, scriptures where God gave this, and let's see it from his word. Davarim, that's Deuteronomy chapter 28, Deuteronomy chapter 28, and we will look at verse 13. Deuteronomy 28 and verse 13 says, Adonai, the Lord, will make you Israel, the head and not the tail. You will be only above, never below. If you will listen, observe, and obey the mitzvah, the commandments of Adonai, your God. So he's promising them, Israel, you'll be the head, not the tail. You'll be above, not beneath. That means you will lead, you won't be servants, or you won't be slaves. Let me put it that way so it makes it clear. This is a great promise to them. It would have been true through their history had they been obedient all along. Look what they gave up. Wait. And we're back to Isaiah again, this time in chapter 2, though. We were in chapter 1, now we're going to Isaiah chapter 2. Yeshayahu, when I say it right. Chapter 2, verse 2. In the, my Hebrew is in the Acherit Hayamim, that's in the last days. Okay, we're coming up on last days. We're not there yet, but remember the last days take in the tribulation period, but they also take in the millennial reign. So we start... The day of the Lord starts on a, a sour note, but it ends on a glorious note. It, it continues on. Now, in those last days, the mountain of the house of the Lord will be established as the chief of the mountains. It will be raised above the hills. All the nations will stream to it. Many peoples will come, and they'll say, Come, let's go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Yaakov so that he may teach us about his ways, so that we may walk in his paths. For the law, God's command, will go out from Zion, and the word of the Lord 
from Yerushalayim, the word of Adonai from Yerushalayim, from Jerusalem. So where is this mountain of the Lord? Jerusalem, Mount Zion, which is one of the mountains part of Jerusalem. This is where all the nations will stream to it. It's going to be raised up. I find it very interesting, the temple in uh, Shlomo's day, the temple ruins that we see today, when you visit the western wall, which is the retaining wall around the temple, it was not the western wall of the temple, it was a retaining wall. When you visit it, you're down below. When you go up on the Temple Mount, you go up a ramp to come up to the height of the Temple Mount. When you see an aerial view looking down, you see that the Temple Mount is raised and Jerusalem was around it. Not, not a huge height, but a bit of a difference. Here, I think it's going to be very high and lifted up from the sound of it. It's going to be the chief among all the mountains. It's going to be the highest. It's going, everything's going to look up to the glory of our God, the glory of the Lord sitting on his throne, ruling and reigning with, with, uh, within Yerushalayim, comma, Israel. I could go political, but I won't. I'll stay with the Bible right now and go to chapter 24. <laughs> chapter 24 and verse 23 of Isaiah. Same book, just go a few more chapters and go to 24, and we want to look at verse 23. This again gives us an idea of the timing so we know we're on that same page. Then the moon will be, and you can have confused or you can have ashamed, the sun will be put to shame. For Adonai Sava'ot, the Lord of armies, the Lord of hosts, will rule on Mount Zion and in Yerushalayim, and his glory will be before his elders. His glory will be before the rulers of the people. The elders, remember, like in the congregation, in the church, the elders are serving that head pastor. They're representing him to the people. Remember all these that I told you, the princes and the priests and the shepherds and the judges and the Talmudim are all the rulers, and they are going to be sharing the glory of the Lord with the people. From where? Where is the Lord who is the, the Lord of armies, the Lord of the heavenly host, which is also his army? Where is he reigning from? We know he's reigning from heaven on high, but he's also going to be reigning from Mount Zion, and from it, which is in Yerushalayim. So when does this happen? When the moon and the sun are put to shame. When does the moon and the sun get shamed? How about at the very last days of the tribulation when the sun is darkened and the moon won't give its light? The stars are falling from the heavens and we have all of that in the very last days, the last trumpet I believe it is, if not it's very close to it when we read about it in the book of Revelation just before the return of the Lord. So it fits. Even, even the nature, the signs within nature have shown, have been shook to their core and now the rule and reign of Messiah, Yeshua Jesus, on his earthly throne, the kingdom of heaven come down to earth. Hallelujah. Okay. Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 3 and verse 17. <clears throat> Remember, we like to have our witnesses. We want to make our case solid in court so we don't go on the word of one. It also keeps us safe from getting off on a false doctrine. It helps us be balanced when we see Scripture helping us understand Scripture. We know we can feel pretty safe about what we are saying. So does Jeremiah back up Isaiah? Well, verse 17 of chapter 3 says, At that time they will call Jerusalem, Jerusalem, they'll call it the throne of the Lord. And all the nations will assemble at it, at Jerusalem. Yerushalayim at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord and they will no longer follow the stubbornness of their evil heart. Can it get more specific? Do you think that this meant to say Washington D.C.? Mm -hmm. Do you think it meant to say uh, oh, where do I want somewhere in England or, or did, it, did it mean somewhere in Africa? You know God is when he gives the specific take him literally if, you, if it can't make sense literally, then we look for symbolic meaning. But it says it so clearly here. They'll assemble at Jerusalem. The name of the Lord is there. They'll call it the throne of the Lord. Why are they calling it that if it's not <coughs> sitting on his throne there? I would call Queen Elizabeth's throne the throne of England. I wouldn't call it the throne of the United States. It's where he is, where he's ruling. 
The name of the Lord is there. It is established on earth. Is that happening today? They've got temple ruins. Is it happening there? No. Sadly, no. Israel's not recognizing her Messiah. Messiah isn't ruling and reigning from there. We're going to see a third temple built, but we're going to see that third temple desecrated horribly by the Antichrist who's going to put an image of himself in there for the worship to come to him. We're going to see that, that temple destroyed. I'm talking the temple that Hezekiel, Ezekiel chapter 40 through 48 describes. And when you see the size, and we're going to get into that, that's the only time that it fits also is that future temple that will be filled with the glory of the Lord. And the last time the temple was filled with the glory of the Lord, we have to go back into the original covenant. We go back uh, in um, uh, <coughs> I, I, it's, he's Ezekiel, I believe. I think it's Ezekiel that gives a description. If I'd known I was going to say it, I would have looked up. I'm trying to get the right chapter. The early chapters in the first half of the book of Ezekiel, in there it talks about how the, the um, Spirit of God lifted from the Holy of Holies, hovered at the door of the, the temple building, that holy place, and then it hovered outside of the camp of of the um, tabernacle, if I remember correctly. Finally, I remember it goes over and hovers on the hill on the side. I believe that's the hill on the east because it's, we're told that the glory of the Lord will come through the eastern gate back into the temple. So I believe the way it went out, it's going to come back. Those are some of the saddest verses in Scripture. I see a grieving spirit of God that didn't want to leave was hoping the people would turn, would realize their wicked ways, and would turn back, and, and the Spirit of God could remain there, and there could be the glorious time that is there when we're worshiping in a right relation with our God. But Israel wouldn't have it, and she ends up going into captivity for it. But here it's returning. God doesn't say, you, you blew it, Jerusalem, I'm done with you. No, he says, I'm going to put my temple right where your temple was, but I'm going to make it so much bigger higher and so much more glorious in the whole place not just the holy of holies um the the holiest place in the holy building he's going to fill the whole place with his presence that's amazing for the people on the millennial earth that's amazing why do i say it that way because guess what we get to glory in when we go to our heavenly home we are in presence of his glory that don't confine heaven. Heaven's not a little city, people. Heaven's not just a few little streets of gold. Oh, hello. Heaven is huge. Heaven is bigger than our minds can comprehend. Yes, there are golden streets. Yes, there is the throne. Yes, there is the river flowing from the throne that has trees on each side of it that people are going to eat from. We get to eat in heaven for those of you who like to eat. <laughs> heaven is huge. And the gloriousness of heaven, I haven't begun to describe. That's our home. That's what we're going to glory in. That's where the moment we leave this body, that's ours. Hallelujah. But I'm thrilled for earth to finally get what God intended for this earth. Will we see any of the temples built before the, the rapture? Will we see the temple built before the rapture? We could, but we don't have to. So it could happen on either side. We know that everything is ready now. All the paraphernalia, everything that goes into the temple to make it um, workable, you know, to function. We've, we've seen it. We've been there. I've been there twice. Temple Mount Institute is not a museum. It's not a place to go look at examples. It's the real McCoy. When they have their temple built, and they make it very clear, they tell you that. As soon as the temple is built, this room empties out. All, well, it's more in the room. This building empties out, and all that you saw goes right into the temple and right into practice. We know they have the high priest robe. We know that they're working on the red heifer. I have not heard that they have it yet. The rumors are out there, but it has to be at least two years old, can't get any white hairs, and the last one got disqualified before she hit two years of age. So they're still working on it, and trust me, when it needs to be there, they'll have one. If God's doing everything else, he'll have that too. But we're right there, my, my reason for saying all of this, and by the way, I have been asked to follow this study. I was reminded, I promised to follow this study with the, the red heifer, 
Oh my goodness, what a study that is. That'll be one class, but that is, wow. I, I don't remember my title now, The Mystery of the Red Heifer or something like that. Oh, wow. Anyway, that's coming. <laughs> you won't let me forget them. <laughs> so that, that's a couple of weeks off at least, but it is coming, and it is, uh, uh, wow. Okay, I've said enough of that, but um, the, the answer to the question is, because I see all of that, if there was a way to build the temple now, the group that has made all of this, every so often tries to lay the cornerstone. That's what they have to do to start. And it starts such a ruckus because the Temple Mount area is in Arab control. Why is it in Arab control in the land of Israel? Because in 1967, when Jerusalem was reunited, and that was miraculous, that was nothing but the hand of God that allowed them the victory. If you have not uh, seen that movie out recently, that, that's on, uh, okay, it's on the, the, the reunification. Um, they celebrated the 50 years of Jerusalem being reunited. The title will come to me anyway. A recent um, documentary done very well. Um, when that happened, Israel wanted to make peace with their Arab neighbors. The Arabs had had control of the Temple Mount area. They had had control of the Western Wall. Israel now had rights to the Western Wall. If you want to cry, see Golda Meir go to the wall for the first time. Adopts the soldier there. It's, I, it's so moving. Anyway, Moshe Dayan was one of the heads that was in control with all that was going on. And he said, look, let's let's." Okay, not a nice way to put it, this is my words, but let's throw the dog a bone, okay? The Arabs have two mosques up there. We respect people and their religions. Israel has always been a respecter of other people's religions. That's good and that's bad. But anyway, they said, let's allow them to have their mosques and have that control to make peace with us. We'll, we've got our Western Wall back. We can worship down here. The Orthodox won't go up to the Temple Mount anyway because they don't know where the Holy of Holies was for sure, and they don't want to accidentally step in the place that was holy, so they won't even go up. So he thought this was a good way to appease. Has it brought peace? Absolutely not. There's fighting continually going on from that area. Uh, I could go into a lot of history on it, but it's a contentious point to this day. Um, the last big ruckus was when a, a Jewish person wore his kippah up on the Temple Mount and a Muslim guard forced him to remove his kippah. And it hit the fan in Israel. How could a Jew in Israel not be allowed to wear his kippah? Uh, Netanyahu tried to find a middle ground and it, it, it never was solved. It's still an ongoing issue. So something would have to happen to calm that down, to enable it to, to either share control up there, which some people think will happen, or for there to be a change so that the Arabs do not want that area. Some believe the mosque will be picked up and moved to uh, Mecca. Others believe the mosque will be destroyed by an earthquake. Others believe that the temple will be built side by side with the mosque. There are many theories out there, but something has to happen to allow the Arabs and the Israelis to not be contentious with each other for that temple to be rebuilt. I tend to think, notice I'm saying I tend to think. I'm not giving you scripture and verse, I'm giving you pearl thoughts. What do I call them? <laughs> Don't cast your pearls before swine, so obviously you're not swine. I'm sharing my pearls with you. <laughs> this is oh, terrible. Oh, this is terrible. I don't, I, I'm afraid to say pearls of wisdom because it's my <clears throat> thought. That's why I was trying to frantically think, what can I say? But I think I've made it clear. I'm, I'm letting you know this is just my thought. But what I see as a very likely picture is when the Antichrist comes on the scene, immediately comes on as a false when to make peace. I've got the answer. I can bring the Arabs and Israelis on the same page. Shake my hand, Israel. We'll make a peace treaty. We'll strengthen the peace treaty that's there, actually. And we'll live side by side in peace. And furthermore, to prove to you, Israelis, that we don't really want to wipe you off the face of the map. We want to live in peace. Build your temple. Here's, here's what you've wanted. Here's your desire. Build your temple. We'll, we'll work along with that. Antichrist thinking in the back of his mind, yeah, build it for me. 
You spend your time, your energy, your money, your dollars, and I'll take it over for myself because I want that worship. But he doesn't say that outwardly. Outwardly, it looks like it's a great plan. So in my mind, I think it's going to be a catalyst right right very shortly after the rapture occurs. I think that's when there's going to be that opportunity for them to look like they, they can both play in the same sandbox, they can both make nice, they can shake mm -hmm. hands. Israel finally has an air partner that wants peace and is willing to do what they say, and they're going to go along with it. And then, of course, it turns on them. I do know the temple is built by the midpoint when the sacrifices are stopped. If they're stopped, that means they've started. They can't do sacrifices anywhere except at the temple, at the, the altar designated for the sacrifices. So that has to be started before the midpoint of the tribulation. Again, to me, I don't see it happening before the rapture because I don't see, you know, unless something suddenly changes the geographic picture up there and I'm not one who really goes to, to those thoughts like some do, but that's not my bend. I think it's more likely that we have this tenuous false peace and, and the Antichrist throws Israel the bone now this time and says, here, build your temple. Now, there could be one more little layer that would help bring this about. It is believed, and I do believe this, that they do know where the Ark of the Covenant is. The Ark of the Covenant belongs in the holy place. You know, well, that, in fact, is part of the mercy seat. It's in the Holy of Holies. Okay? I do believe because I know personally the person who is the personal friend of the rabbi of the wall in Israel. When our friend, um, who is brilliant, who is a scholar, who is Old Testament studied on a level I wish I could attain, I highly respect him. I sit at his feet to learn from him. He asked the rabbi of the wall, who they're both best friends. They're, they're very, very good friends. He prays for, for the rabbi's salvation. The rabbi just knows that this, this one loves me. And, you know, hopefully the love of the Lord will, will win him over. But he asked him one day when they were able to... Uh, um, to me, actually, the rabbi was in his regalia. He was at the wall. He is just finishing up a service he was doing. And our friend was told, you can go see him, but don't talk to him because of what's going on. And our friend said, okay, you know, I'll respect that. But when the rabbi saw him, he welcomed him in, and they were allowed to talk. And as they were talking about different things, the ark came up. And he said to the rabbi, he says, Rabbi, I believe that the ark has been discovered. Is that true? And he said the rabbi would not answer, but he got a big smile on his face, and he just left it there. I think it was his way of not rocking the boat because he could get in trouble for saying yes, but it was certainly he was not discouraging my personal friend. So on the basis of other things that I've heard and in this personal contact, I do believe they know where the ark is. Now, if that ark is brought out, and again, I'm going to think when this world face changes rapidly at the rapture, I think that's what may bring it out also, but it could come out ahead. When it's found, wouldn't it sound likely or logical for the Antichrist to say at that time, you know what? You found your ark, and that's quite a relic. It's, it's, we, we realize how much you respect that ark, build the temple to go around it, and boom, mm -hmm. they'd be off and going. So again, I kind of, my personal, I look for it right after the rapture, which means we won't see it, mm -hmm. you know, not unless we look down from heaven, and I'll tell you, during the seven years down here on earth, I've got better things to do than look at what's going on down here. <laughs> Sorry, but again, personal opinion, but i got my eyes on the Lord and what's going on up there. I know enough of what's going on down here. I don't want to see it. <laughs> and then, of course, you know, time marches on. So am so I looking for it? I don't think we will. But if we did, it would not rattle my cage. I wouldn't think, oh, no, I'm wrong about pre-trib. No, it wouldn't rattle my cage at all. It could happen before. I just think it's more likely after the rapture. Oh, okay. It definitely does not have to happen before the rapture. There's no sign that we are waiting for for the rapture. Everything that has to happen before the rapture has happened. The next thing on God's agenda 
is the rapture. He alone knows when that is. To us, it's like, this is so long, God. But when you look at eternity, what's a thousand years? It says a day. Yeah, really. So in his perfect timing. Remember when Messiah came the first time? He came in the fullness of time. He came exactly at the right time to be born in exactly the right location. It took a Gentile putting out a decree that had never been put out before to take a pregnant woman from Nazareth, nine months pregnant, <laughs> and bring her down to deliver in Bethlehem. Bethlehem. God's hand moves in the Gentiles, he moves in the Jews, he's working his plan. If Messiah had come a year earlier, he wouldn't have been born in Bethlehem. If he came later, he wouldn't have been the right age, the right dating, the right time to enter the, the Yerushalayim on what you call Palm Sunday because he was to come in lowly, riding on a donkey, and it would be what we call the Passion Week, and he would be cut off in the middle of it. That had to happen all in the perfect timing that agreed with that decree from 445 B.C. that we have in history, in our historical books, that the, the city and its streets were to be rebuilt. Remember, there were other decrees, but the one that went out that was of both, that was the marker that started God's time counting down to when Messiah would be born, and he didn't miss it by a day. He didn't miss it by a minute. He didn't miss it by a year. Now, if he's that exact on his first coming, I believe he's that exact on his second coming. His second coming will be exactly when it is to be that his feet are to touch the Mount of Olives. And if we are to be raptured seven years before that, which I believe, then we will go, and seven years later, he will come all the way down to earth. God's timing, God's way, perfect. We'll see in his plan, when we see it from his view, we will see he didn't miss the second coming by a day or a minute either. He said, man doesn't know the day or the hour. That was in God's hands. God knows, and God is working it. So whenever all of this is, God's plan is perfect. But I can tell you, there's nothing left to be fulfilled for him to say, come home. Or come up here. That's the words I think we'll hear because of Revelation 4, verse 1. I think we're going to hear, come up here. And he scoots, he toots, and we scoot. <laughs> That's Prophet Claremont. Evolutionists okay. wants us to do away with A, C, and B, C, and put an E on the end of it. It's not even... So it's A, C, E. <laughs> it's not even just, yeah, it's not even just the evolutionists. It is those who do not want the calendar marked by... Our Messiah. Yeah, they they call it the common era. They don't <clears throat> even call it before Christ because mm -hmm. they don't want to acknowledge. But the calendar is counted by him. The Antichrist takes a calendar and changes it again, changes the dates and the times for his desire. They're going to go through a, a huge change of all kinds of things during the tribulation, but nothing can wipe it out. The same way that they took Israel, they took the people out of the land. They kept her out of the land for almost 2,000 years, and yet she remained a people. No other people has ever done that. They're out of their land, they assimilate, and they disappear. You don't know where Amalekites are, and Agagites, and, and Hittites, and Girgashites, and all of those. They're gone today. But God said, I'll never make a full land of Israel. God said, I will never cease to have a people. He's kept a remnant even when they were cast out in 70 AD. He had a remnant of Jewish believers. He has always kept his remnant. The Gentile believers are, are um, grafted into that remnant, but God keeps his word faithfully, and so his timing will be fulfilled. We will see it he will bring Israel back as he promised. I lost my train of thought where I was going. Hopefully I covered my point. But, uh, but we just we see the orderliness of our God. We see the promises fulfilled. We see a literal fulfillment in Jerusalem that we're talking about now. So we know. Um, I know I was, I was going somewhere. I'm trying to pull it back. When it pops in, I'll bring it out. 
But again, everything that has to be done has been done. We're just waiting on that final uh, one that's going to come into saving faith because when the body of Messiah is complete, the body of Christ, when that's complete, that's when we go home. So if you want him to hurry up and come, do your work. Get out there and share the good news so that whoever we're waiting on can get saved and we can go home. <laughs> And, of course, we hope that's our family members. You know, we understand God's long-suffering and his patience. He's not willing that any should perish. But there will be a day when he will say, enough is enough. The last have been saved that he's going to bring in in the remnant called the church, that he's going to take home in rapture, and he's going to say, it's time for my cup of wrath to be pulled out on the evil of this world. Is this world ready to be judged by our God? <sighs> Listen to the news, and I think we're there. Sadly, I and really think we're there. the word because Nero and all the wicked kings tried to do away with the gospel and Hitler, and they never succeeded. So we're not, they're not going to succeed here either. God will never leave this earth destitute of his word and his spirit moving on the face of the earth. I hear people say that all the time, you know, how can he remove the Christians at the time Israel needs them the most? How long? Israel needs us. Israel needs her God. That's right. <laughs> and if he has to personally, miraculously put a hedge over her, he will do that. He doesn't yeah. need the believers. Does it leave this earth void of the Spirit? No. The Spirit of God was on the face of this earth forming it or reforming it for us. The Spirit of God moved in the hearts. David prayed, don't take your spirit from me. We see the Spirit of God come on King Shaol. We see it leave King Shaol. We see the Spirit of God moving long before the church got on the face of this earth. So why do we think that the Lord can't do without the church? Of course he can. His Spirit moved before it. His spirit will move after it. The difference is in our age, the spirit of God indwells us permanently, seals us, holds on to us, and takes us home. We're privileged. No other generation got that. They got the spirit of God coming and going. We get him staying. Tribulation, the spirit of God will come and go. That's why the 144,000 had to be marked, had to be sealed. If they had been sealed with the Holy Spirit, why did they need a seal from God again to do their work? Because the Spirit is going on them to do their work and leaving, sealing them on their forehead with the name of God protects them where they cannot have life taken from them until they've accomplished their task. Some believe they'll live out the, the whole tribulation period. It could be. It could be. Either way, it won't be till their work is finished. That's the difference. The Spirit of God will move. How could anyone get saved during the tribulation if the Spirit of God wasn't moving and tugging on the hearts? And those who have heard us and heard us and heard us but haven't made that final rejection of the Lord and we disappear and they come to saving faith because we disappeared, there's your start with the Holy Spirit having people to work through. Very quickly, the 144,000 are raised up. I believe that they could be some of the Jewish people we're talking to today. And I don't mean just me. I mean worldwide Jewish missions that's taking the gospel to the Jewish people. If the rapture is in our lifetime, as I feel it is, if it's tomorrow, those people that, that we've been witnessing to that haven't accepted yet could be easily among the 144,000. What's our ministry doing? Laying down the, the road work for the 144,000 to come drive across it and take the gospel to the ends of the earth. That's when that scripture is fulfilled. There's those who say, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. The whole earth has to hear the gospel before the Lord can return for us. No, the whole world hears the gospel before his second coming, before the Lord returns with his feet on the Mount of Olives, not the rapture, his feet, the second coming. The, the word of God does not have to be heard by every ear before the rapture, just before the return of the Lord. The scriptures are clear. It's to the return of the Lord. The 144,000 will fulfill that. What they don't get to, the angels that are swinging in the heavens that, that, that um, are declaring the gospel from the heavens during the tribulation period, 
there will be those who hear. God works in huge ways during the tribulation to carry the gospel to the ends of the earth. Then the Lord returns. So nothing holding us up, nothing keeping us from going. Let me move on because I, I want to get us further. Um, again, Jerusalem, the capital, Israel ahead. Zechariah, I'll give you your third witness. Zechariah, chapter 8 and verse 3. The Lord says this, I, and the Lord speaking, I will return to Zion, dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. Then Jerusalem will be called the city of truth, and the mountain of the Lord of armies will be called the holy mountain. All of Jerusalem's history, you do not have it called the city of truth. You do not have it called the holy mountain. The holy mountain means that it is holy. Why is it holy? Because the temple's on that mountain and the Lord is sitting, ruling, and reigning from that mountain. Why is it called the city of truth? Because the one who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, is the one sitting on that holy mountain, expounding his truth to the entire world. That's when Jerusalem will get this. Never has she had it. And if you go to Jerusalem right now, I love Israel. I love Jerusalem. I, I, I lose my heart in Jerusalem. If Brenda were on here today, she would tell you how she watched me just melt into my people and my homeland when we were there. I belong there. I love them. But my heart grieves because I saw face after face after face not in tune with their God, not listening to their God, not worshiping their God, not at the temple, not at the city of truth because it's not even there. And Jerusalem, even though it has the holy sites, it's not a holy city. It's got people in it who are just as wicked and evil there as they are anywhere else on the face of this earth. There are people who are shocked when they go to Israel because they expect this religious community to be the whole of Israel, and it's not. It, it, there, I wish it were. I wish that the Israel's here was in tune to her God. It will be one day, but it's not now. So this obviously is future. This is when the Lord dwells there. That's why it will be called the City of the Truth on the holy mountain in Jerusalem. Since we're in this book, just go to chapter 14, same book, Zechariah, for my last proof. I've given you three proofs already. Well, I've given you Deuteronomy, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Zechariah. I've given you four. I think I've proved my point. I think I could win the case in court. Chapter 14, verse 8 says, On that day, living waters will flow out of Jerusalem. That's not happening now. Half of them will go toward the eastern sea, the other half toward the western sea. It will be in summer as well as in winter. Year round, there's going to be this, this river of water that's going to go out and it's going to feed, I believe it's feeding the Mediterranean. Uh, that would be on the west and I believe on the east. Am I saying that right? I am saying it right. Okay, and on the east I believe that it's referring to what right now is called the Dead Sea, which won't be dead in that time. Oh, we're beginning to get that geographical description that I want us to get to today. So that's why I wanted you to hear this verse. Keep it in mind and remember it, and we will explain it more fully um, in, in a bit uh, when we get there. But right now, drop down to verses 16 and 17. Okay. Zechariah, Sorry. chapter 14, verses 16 and 17. With that in mind, of the waters that are flowing from the throne, 16, then it will come about that any who are left of all the nations that came against Jerusalem. Does that not sound like the Battle of Armageddon? All the nations that came against Jerusalem? Any who are left, who, who didn't die off in that, will go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of armies, both those names we've heard from Messiah in relation to the, the Millennial Kingdom, and they're going to go to celebrate Sukkot, the Feast of Booths. Remember when they dwell in the, the Sukkah, in the, the um, lean-to, to remind them of how God brought them through the wilderness? That's the short form of it. Verse 16 says they're all going to be coming to Jerusalem year to year to celebrate this. Do all the Jews go and do that today? No, but they will. Verse 17, it will be that whichever the families of the earth does not go up to Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of armies, there will be no rain on them. So all the nations, everybody's going to have to go up. They have to honor this. Then they go back to their nations, and their nations receive rain, which means they have crops to eat. They are a blessed country. But if they don't go up, they will not be blessed. So again, Jerusalem's the head, uh, cap the capital of the head nation, Israel, during the, the uh, millennial reign. 
We talked last week a little bit, let me bring it out again, of David's kingdom being restored. This we're going to look at, um, okay, we're in, let's go back to, let's go to Amos. Amos, good place to start. A-M-O-S, one of the little prophets, whoops. Um, little only in meaning it is a shorter book. We want to go to Amos chapter 9, and we're going to look at verses 11 and 12. Amos chapter 9. Verses 11 and 12. Will David be raised again to sit on a throne? Or is that just figurative language for the Messiah? Okay, two camps. One says that's just speaking of Messiah, and the other camp is saying it's speaking literally of David, who will be under Messiah. Okay, they never, they never say that he's in Messiah's place. In verse 11 we read, On that day I will raise up the fallen tabernacle, the fallen shelter of David. Remember, David was the first one to make the tabernacle a home, permanent home. Actually, his son Solomon, Shlomo carried it out, but it was David who made the plans. It was David who went home to his palatial palace and said, Wait a minute, God, I, I got a problem. You dwell in a tent you dwell in dust and in dirt. You dwell in this little spot that we don't even get to see. Only the high priest gets to see. God, you deserve the most beautiful place on the face of this earth. Look at the palace I live in. I don't like that, God. I want you to live in a place that's more spectacular than what I have. I want to build you a permanent home. God was moving on his heart. David had the right motive, but God said, David... You've got hands of war, bloody hands. You're, uh, you've got, you've killed men. You have, you're, you're known for war. You can't build a house that's for peace and for worship of me. But your son can. You can get all, get it all set up for him, and your son will carry it out. And that's what happens. David gets them on a huge building fund. He gets them to help bring their wealth. Together, they were excited. They built this place so gorgeous that when the second temple is built, those who, who remembered the first knew that this was it wasn't anything like the first. It was just wow. And that was nothing like the one we'll see in the millennium. But here we go. David's tabernacle, his temple, his shelter will be raised up. Wall up its gaps. There won't be holes. I will raise up its ruins and rebuild it as the days of old. So what David had will be rebuilt so that they may possess the remnant of Edom. Edom is, is at war with them, but at this point, they're going to, to have that area even of Edom. And all the nations who are called by my name declares the Lord who does this. I believe from this and from other scriptures that I will show you that God is saying I will literally rebuild David's tabernacle, David's temple, and David will, I, I believe David is going to sit there. We'll, we'll go on and we'll see more. Let me take you, I hope I'm doing this out of order and I hope I won't regret. Jeremiah, because before we go to the new, I want you to see. Jeremiah, Jeremiah uh, 33 and verse 17. We're going to look at that also. Uh, then we're going to go into the Brita Hadashah, the New Covenant. Yermia chapter 3, verse 17. For this is what Adonai, the Lord, says. There will never be cut off from David, from David, a man to occupy the throne of the house of Israel. That's my complete Jewish Bible. My New American says, David shall not lack a man to sit on the throne of the house of Israel. We know that today there is a lack. This is yet to be fulfilled, and if it's to happen forever, then I think it has to be from the millennial kingdom forward. And it sounds to me like it could be David or a descendant from these verses, because it says David won't lack a man. The house of David won't lack a man. Now, we know the one who came through David's line is Messiah. We know when Messiah reigns, it will be forever. So this can be referring to Messiah, but it can also be a double meaning and refer to one out of the loins of David after Messiah also or before Messiah, let me just say, out of the house of David. That's why I'm saying scripture could be taken either way. It, those who want to say it's literally Messiah only, I have no problem with them. Those who believe that it could be David raised up because there are scriptures that say David will be raised up, that, that could be very likely too. 
Um, I don't believe that we can be dogmatic and go out on the line and say which way is which, but um, there's good evidence on both sides. Um, let me take you to, uh, let's go to Acts, and then we're going, going to come back into our original covenant, but let's go to Acts and see what was said there. Acts chapter 15. This is the council that came up to discuss how do we deal with the Gentiles in relation to the temple? What's required of them? If we no longer have to make these sacrifices, how can we expect them to have to make sacrifices? And yet the Gentiles had to to, to proselyte into Judaism for salvation. So they're wrestling. This is the first generation right after Messiah has ascended back into heaven, and they're, they're trying to figure what they have to do. Out of the council, it is decided that the, the Gentiles are not proselyting to Judaism any longer. There are certain things are asked to stay away from, idols, things strangled, things um, with blood, and from uh, fornication, because those were just such sticky points with the Jewish people that if they were involved in these things and mixing it in the temple area, it just troubled the, the Jewish people. So like Shaul Paul said later, don't do something that will make your brother stumble. This was what they came out of. But here we're going to deal with a different um, aspect of what also this council is talking about. So in chapter 15, I want us to look at verse 14. Verse 14 is calling Peter Simeon in our Hebrew Shimon. This is Simon Peter, okay? He has described, James is talking, Yaakov James, one of the head pillars of the church after Messiah is raptured, okay? James and uh, um, John and Peter, uh, before Paul is raised up, we see these three being the strong pillars and leaders, okay? So James is, in fact, James is the head of the council here. He's, after they've spoken, he's responding saying, brothers, okay, keyword brothers. I could put the word believers in there. It doesn't just mean men, but it means those in faith. Uh, James is calling out to those who believe like him. Listen to me. Simon, Peter, Shimon, Kepha has described how God first concerned himself about taking a people for his name from among the Gentiles. God's done something new. We've seen that. He opened up Peter to go to Cornelius' home, a Gentile, and the Holy Spirit fell on them the same way it did in the upper room at what we call Pentecost, what was Shavuot, the same way on the Gentiles as on the Jews. God's showing the Jewish people, I'm, my Spirit's going to come on the Gentiles in the same way as the Jewish people. It's different now. It's not that the, the Gentile comes in under the Jew and can only go so far. Now they're on equal footing. They come in, they're grafted together into the same root. The words of the prophets agree with us, with this. The, the prophets foretold this time we come, just as it is written, and now he quotes what we've already read. After these things I will return. The Lord will return after these things. Okay, time's going to transpire. I will rebuild the fallen tabernacle of David. Isn't that what we just read? I will rebuild its ruins. I will restore it so that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord and all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord who makes these things known from long ago. So there's going to be a tabernacle of David raised up for both Israel and the Gentiles. We don't see that in the temple during um, tribulation time but we do see it in Hezekiel's millennial temple. So I believe that, that the Davidic kingdom will be raised up, David being the, the head ruler. We are seeing that here. Let me take you to, to where David's called a king and a prince, why some people think David himself will sit on an earthly throne from Jerusalem also, but not Messiah's throne. Mm -hmm. Messiah always gets the top spot, okay? Mm -hmm. But let's go back into our original covenant. I've got a number of verses. I probably will give us some, and then I'll give you others to look up on your own. Let's go back to Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 30. Jeremiah 30, and we're going to go to verse 9. Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 30 and verse 9. In this verse it says, But they shall serve the Lord their God, and David their king, whom I will raise up. For them. Now, David's lived before Yermia's time. So, this is not referring to David in his lifetime, and yet it sounds like it's David again. That God is going to raise up, the Lord is going to be um, 
They're going to serve the Lord, says that first, and David, and he's called their king. David is the most respected king of all of Israel's kings. Melch David is looked at as, as being the best. He was God's choice for the people. We know the kings that came after David were less great all the way along, and some were even very bad. Okay, let me show you where else. Let's go to Hezekiel, Ezekiel chapter 34. We know that, that Ezekiel is dealing with end time events because we know 37, Israel's back in the land. 38 and 39, we saw that, that we believe that to be the Battle of Armageddon. And chapter 40, the Millennial Kingdom. So what does chapter 34 tell us? Verses 23 and 24. Ezekiel 34, verses 23 and 24. Then, when we're to that point, then I will appoint over them one shepherd, Remember how we said there's going to be shepherds in Israel during the millennium? Well, it sounds now like there's going to be one head shepherd. Of course, the chief shepherd being the Lord Messiah. But then the head shepherd as far as those, you know, under the Lord. I'm going to raise up one shepherd, my servant David. He will feed them. He will feed them himself and be their shepherd. And I, the Lord, will be their God. And my servant David, David will be prince among them. I, the Lord, have spoken. That strong, that clear, is why I do believe that David will be raised up and will shepherd the people in Israel also. As a prince, in a kingly type role, a leadership role, under the king of kings, under the Lord of lords, under the chief shepherd. But I do see and do believe that David will be raised up because it really sounds like it, does it not? To me it does. Chapter 37, chapter 37, verses 24 and 25 of Ezekiel, just a few pages over. 37, verses 24 and 25. Remember 37, we're dealing with Israel back in the land now. And remember Ezekiel, just like Yermia, it's David lived before. David has died, okay? This is after his period of time. 24, and my servant David will be king over them. See, he's called king also, but again, it's little king. Remember, the Lord is king of kings. My servant David will be king over them. They will all have one shepherd. They will all walk in my ordinances, keep my statutes and follow them. Israel never did that. Not even in David's day. We have the, the rebellions and we have the problems. But here they're going to. And where will it happen? Verse 25, they will live on the land that I gave to my servant Yaakov, Jacob, in which your fathers lived. And they will live on it, they and their sons and their sons' sons forever. And my servant David will be their leader forever. Okay, that nails it for me. If it's going to be forever, it hasn't happened now. We don't have it now. I believe this is future. God's going to raise up David again. He's going to raise him up over the land that God gave to Jacob and to the fathers. That's to Abraham, Yitzhak, and Jacob, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's the area called Israel in its enormity, far bigger than Israel ever had. And I believe God, at that time, when Israel has her full land, she's walking in the ordinances and the statues. She's obedient to the Lord. She is going to have the head shepherd over her, David, David, and he will rule forever, and his, the descendants will go on forever and ever and ever from the house of David that God promised also in 2 Samuel 7 that the kingdom would be forever. Okay, let me give you another source, because remember we like more than one opinion. Hosea, actually these aren't opinions, these are God's words, I can't call it that, but we want to hear it out of more than one mouth. Hosea, Hosea, chapter 3, and let's look at verse 5. Hosea 3 and verse 5. Afterward, okay, after all that, that's gone on that is told about before, um, it's too hard for me to tell you, but trust me, you can read the book of Hosea and see Hosea's wife was unfaithful. God used that as a picture of Israel, that even God kept telling Hosea, go back and get her, go back and get her, let her come back to you, the same way he does with Israel. He never says, Israel, that's it, you can't come back to me. Afterward, after they've come back, the sons of Israel will return. They will seek the Lord their God and David their king. They will come trembling to the Lord and to his goodness when? 
in the last days. Remember what we said? The last days start with the tribulation and go all the way through the millennium. Now we've even had it label our time when David's going to be king shepherd over Israel. So I look for David to be raised up. I believe that we haven't seen yet what all we will see. Um, because we're right here and he's, no, we're not. We went to Hosea. Let me give you some more references in Hezekiel, Ezekiel, that you can look up on your own for the sake of time because I think I've proven my point. Ezekiel chapter 44, verses 1 through 3. Chapter 45, verses 7 to 9. Chapter 46, verses 2, 12, 16, and 18. So we've got chapter 44, 1 through 3, chapter 45, 7 to 9, and chapter 46, 2, 12, 16, and 18. Those chapters, 44, 45, and 46, deal with the millennial kingdom that we're going to be looking at very shortly here to see um, the house of the Lord, what it looked like, you know, it's, it's land it's geographic location. So that's why I'm not going to take time to look those up now. When you see in there the sacrifices are being made, we're going to deal with that question in just a little bit. Um, but uh, I lost my thought. Where was I going with this? Oh, but you'll see that the prince makes sacrifices. Now, because of that, some think maybe that's not David then. It's someone alive, earthly alive in the millennial time. If so, then they'll definitely be of the loins of D David. And I'm not sure how to answer that. I'll tell you when we're in the millennium, okay? <laughs> we'll see and we'll find out then. I don't know whether God would have David making sacrifices again since he is in a different state of being. Um, he has that resurrected body. I don't know. I don't know. I, that's why, again, some will say, you know, well, it's got to only be Messiah. Well, Messiah is certainly not going to be making sacrifices. So it's not the prince that makes sacrifices in those chapters is not Messiah. And we know Messiah is the head over all. Nobody questions that. So hopefully I've given you enough clarity on that. Um, I'm, I want to move through some of these points real quickly, so I may just give us more verses because I really want to get us, since we're on it, into what the temple looks like from Ezekiel 40 to 48. So let me just say quickly, there will be a Jewish population explosion. I think I dealt with that earlier. I'll give you one verse to, to look at with me, and then you can look up the others on your own. This is Ezekiel 36, verses 37 and 38. That's easy to remember. Chapter 36, verses 37 and 38. And here we read, This is what the Lord God says, This too I will let the house of Israel ask me to do for them. I will increase their people like a flock, like the flock for sacrifices, like the flock at Jerusalem during her appointed feast. So will the way cities be filled with the flocks of people? And I love the next phrase, Then they will know I am the Lord. That's beautiful. A ton of people, so many people that they're going to be all over pushing out the seams or even going to be in the area called the Waste Cities. They're going to be so many people and they're all going to know the Lord and who He is. Obviously, that's millennial. That's not now. But you see that the Jewish people are just increasing, increasing, increasing. And remember I said they can live out the whole time of the millennium. They do not have to suffer death if they stay in line with the Lord. Death is a punishment for disobedience. If they stay obedient, they won't have that happen. You can read about this also in Hosea chapter 1 and verse 10. It was promised to Israel all the way back in, in uh, the time of Moshe's time in Deuteronomy chapter 30 verses 5 and 6. And to give you another prophet to round it out, so you'll have four mouths that are saying it. Chapter 30 and verse 19. Jeremiah. Did I say that? Jeremiah. Okay. And the, the Ruch HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, will be poured out on all of them. We know that he pours out in the end days. That's why I say this earth is never void of the Holy Spirit and his move on the face of the earth. Nothing could happen toward salvation if it was. Um, Joel 2, Yoel chapter 2. Verses 27 to 29, I want to read that for you. It says, So you will know I am in the midst of Israel, and that I am the Lord your God, 
and there is no other, and my people will never be put to shame. Okay, if we're going to know the Lord is in the midst of Israel, He is our God, there is no other God, and His people, will, the Jewish people, will never be put to shame, that is not true all the way up to 2021. I guarantee you that Israel is not experiencing or has experienced this, and for it to never change means its future, this means its millennium. 28, it will come about after this, in those last days, when God is building it up and bringing them to this point and going further. At, uh, then I will pour out my spirit on all mankind. When is it going to be able to pour out his spirit on all mankind? When they're all believers. Remember the ones who go into the millennium? Jewish believers, Gentile believers. These are those who lived out through the tribulation, somehow managed to stay alive. They are not given resurrection bodies. They continue on in their physical bodies. Okay, but the millennium starts with only saved people going in. We saw that with all of the parables and, and all that we went through in Matthew and other places, the talents, all of that. The, the, um, when they did it unto the Jewish people, they did it unto the Lord, all of that sheep and goats judgment. That's what I was working for. Okay, so at this time, when the Lord's pouring out his spirit, your sons and your daughters will prophesy, your old men will have dreams, young men will see visions. Do we see first fruits of this? Yes. But when it happens for all, it's going to be in the millennium. Even on the male and female servants, even those who are in the servant positions in the house uh, of, the, 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 of Israel. Um, you know, it's not just the head person that gets it. God's saying, even on the servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. We know those are future days. They are yet to come. Isaiah speaks about this also. Um, Isaiah 44 and verse 3, you can read the same thing. Ezekiel, to give you your third witness, chapter 36, verses 25 to 28, 37, verse 14, and 39, verses 28 and 29. And remember when 38 and 39 are dealing with Armageddon, dealing with the final battle, why I do not put that early or in the middle of the tribulation is because the scripture repeatedly says, and they will know I am the Lord their God. It, it talks about the whole world knowing, it talks about Israel knowing, and it talks about them knowing from that point forever. Does Israel know that right now? No. That's why we pray for the salvation of Israel. That's why we pray for the peace of the original line, because that peace is the Prince of Peace. They need it as desperately as is needed here in the United States and anywhere on the face of this earth. Fulfillment will come in the millennium. Let me give you one last. We'll look at it together. Isaiah 32 and verse 15. Isaiah chapter 32 and verse 15. And we read in Isaiah 32, 15, Until the Spirit is poured out upon us from on high, and the wilderness becomes a fertile field, and the fertile field is considered as a forest. That's when this will be happening. And it goes on and, and continues. Then justice will dwell in the wilderness. Israel's never had that. She's never had the whole place. She has made Israel beautiful. She has made the desert blossom. But ain't nothing yet like when the Lord's doing it. Okay? It's beautiful. So there'll be economic peace and blessing for Israel. Again, I'm just going to give you a couple of references. I could give you a whole slew of this. And I'm going to give you, I think I did last week for the Gentiles. Let's start with our dear Gentiles. You're blessed too. Well, not you, but the millennial Gentiles. Sorry. You're blessed because you're in heaven and you come back with the Lord. But, but the Gentiles later get blessing also. Micah, Micha, chapter 4, verses, oops. Chapter 4, verses 2 to 4. Micah 4, 2 to 4. For you, dear gen, 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 uh, Gentile offspring. Okay? <laughs> um, verse 2. Many nations will come and say, Come, let's go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Yaakov, Jacob, so that he may teach us about his ways. We may walk in his paths, for from Zion will go forth the law, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He will judge between many peoples and render decisions for mighty, distant nations. Then they will beat their swords into plowshares, their spears into pruning hooks. Nations will not lift a sword against nation, and never again will they train for war. Can you imagine? No more war. No more military, because there's not going to be a war. No more weaponry. 
Instead, verse 4, each of them will sit under his vine and under his fig tree. That shows proliferation. That shows, you know, the abundance with no one to make them afraid because the mouth of the Lord of armies, the mouth of the Lord of hosts, the mouth of Adonai Sava'ot has spoken. But you see where he's saying blessing is? On the nations. The nations aren't going to go to war anymore either. The nations are going to know peace. The nations are going to be blessed. All of this, this is for the nations also. So Gentile future is great too. Now let's look at Israel. We'll go back to Isaiah, Yeshia, chapter 27. Isaiah, chapter 27, and verse 6. In the days to come, Yaakov, Jacob, will take root. Israel will blossom and sprout. They will fill the whole world with fruit. You know what? I think I touched on this last week. Remember some of my topics overlap because I remember telling you how my dad saw Jaffa oranges in a restaurant in San Bernardino, California. The men who were drinking orange juice that day were drinking Israeli oranges. <laughs> but this will happen everywhere. And it won't be, wow, look at this. It'll be the common. Israel's going to fill the face of the earth with fruit. That means she's got an abundance. She's got enough not only to fill up her own people but to share it. And if you've ever tasted Israeli fruit, oh my goodness, I can only imagine how much better in the millennium. But let me tell you, I have never tasted watermelon like vine ripened Israeli watermelon ever since. It has ruined watermelon for me <laughs> and other fruit also. It's delicious and it's nothing like what will be here. And if you think, oh, but that's for the millennial people. What about us? You know, I want that. Well, remember, we've got that tree up in heaven that has different fruit all the time. And when we eat off of that tree, we're going to take that and we're going to take a bite and we're going to say, and I thought that strawberry was good down there on earth. And, and I thought that cantaloupe was good. Oh, I had no idea what good was. <laughs> so no worries. You never get hungry in heaven. You don't get so I'm hungry. I'm thinking, how yeah. are we going to enjoy food if we're not hungry? But <laughs> you don't have to be hungry to enjoy That's food. That's exactly but... where I was going. Why do we have overweight people? And I mean that, including myself, I mean that worldwide. Because we eat when we're not hungry and not needing, and we eat the wrong things because we like to eat. But to me, it's not as good. It's more better if it's not, if I'm hungry. <laughs> of course, I enjoy it so of much course, more, it's you know? more better if you're hungry. Yeah. But that's with your sin nature on a sinful earth. Now go into a heavenly body, a new body. No, it's not overeating, and it's not eating out of a need. It's because God just made it for our enjoyment. Just, just enjoy it. Somebody sent me a... So we'll a, enjoy it just like we're hungry. Yes, and even more so. Oh. Yeah, somebody sent me a, a short video. I can't remember. It might be one of you all. It shows um, the, the singer. I, I can't catch the words. It's a foreign language. But it just shows a number of flowers in their natural, you know, not, not picked, but in their natural. And it's just short, but it just goes from this delicate beauty to this delicate beauty to this, wow. Yesterday, I, I was somewhere where I saw a cactus that, you know, cactus, there are cactus that bloom, okay, and they have flowers. But this cactus, the leaves look like the Gerber daisy flower, only not in the same color, but that shape, you know, those, those shapes. This cactus, the leaves were were like flowers, let alone the flowering of it. I mean, I just thought, God, you are amazing. And in this one area, there were so many different types of succulent cacti. Just that alone, I'm going, God, your imagination is amazing. That's what we're saying. Just let it explode because you're going to have more fruit and better fruit and that's just one thing and you're going to have the beauties like i said heaven's gorgeous heaven isn't brick and mortar people yeah. yes there are the streets of gold because god says it but that's under our feet you know you get to walk on gold walk on it. and it's a transparent gold that you're going to see through oh, eye yeah. wow okay <clears throat> back on track what's this we're going to have here on this earth chapter 30 and verses 23 <clears throat> and 24 did i read this isaiah 30 23 and 24 i think that's where i was going isaiah then he 30, will yes 15, okay well now put down 30 verses 23 and 24 then he will give you rain for your seed which you will sow in the ground they're still going to plant bread from the yield of the ground 
what you plant, it's going to, you're going to get a crop. You're not going to have a gale come and ruin your crop, and you're not going to have an enemy come and attack you and take over and eat your crops. It will be rich. It will be plentiful. On that day, your livestock will graze in a wide pasture. That's abundance. I remember when they had trouble getting food to the farmers back in the Midwest, and I remember seeing a, um, a truck that came on. They finally, somebody had sent in the hay, and as this truck came onto the farmer's land where the, the, they were filming this, the cows were literally running to that truck, mooing because they smelled their lunch. They were hungry, those poor things. This is an abundance. <clears throat> Nobody's going to be mooing and groaning for hunger, even the animals. Verse 24, the ox and the donkeys that work the ground will eat seasoned feed. They're not just going to eat junk. Their food's going to be seasoned. I like seasoning, don't you? <laughs> it's going to be nice food, which has been winnowed with shovel and pitchfork. There's so much work to do. They're going to be winnowing the land. They're going to be feeding the animals with it. It goes on and on. I Let me give you a couple more references to look up in Isaiah 61, verses 5 and 6. In 65 verses 21 to 23. Now let me give you one in Jeremiah and then I'll give you some more to look at. Were we in class, I could give you copies of all these references. Anyone who I go to fast for and you need me to send you a copy, I'll snail mail it to you or email. Just get to me and, and we'll work it out, okay? Jeremiah, Jeremiah <coughs> chapter 31 and verse 12. And that goes for the... Um, the, Zoom, the past the Zoom audience, the archives too. If you're hearing this, there's a way to connect to, to our email address. Connect us and we'll, we'll get you what you need. Okay? They will come and shout for joy on the height of Zion. Now we know Mount Zion is in Jerusalem. They will be radiant over the bounty of the Lord, over the grain, the new wine, the oil. That, that's abundant of, of what the grain is sustenance needed. Wine is the symbol of joy and proliferation. The wealthy were the ones that had wine and oil. Over the young of the flock and the herd, and their life will be like a watered garden. They will never languish again. So even the livestock are, are just going to be so blessed. In Jeremiah, also look up chapter 32 and verse 15, 33, chapters 12. I mean, I'm sorry, chapter 33, verses 12 and 13. Ezekiel, we've looked enough at today. These are some repetitive verses, I think, or they're close by. Ezekiel chapter 34, verses 26 and 27. In chapter 36, verses 33 to 38, Isaiah tells us, Jeremiah tells us, Ezekiel tells us, Joel and Amos and Zechariah also tell us, Joel chapter 2, verses 21 through 27, and chapter 3 and verse 18, Amos chapter 9, verses 13 to 15, and Zechariah 8, 12 and 13. Again, some of these we've already read for other purposes because they overlap. That's why I'm doing it. Let me just show you quickly. The curse is removed from the vegetable kingdom. That curse began in Bereshit in Genesis chapter 3. Let's go there and look real quick. Genesis 3, we're going to look at verses 17 to 19. Genesis 3, 17. This is when the curse is going to come on the, the land. Then to Adam he said... <clears throat> Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and you've eaten from the tree about which I commanded you, saying you shall not eat from it, cursed is the ground because of you. With hard labor you shall eat from it all the days of your life, both thorns and thistles that shall grow for you. You shall eat the plants of the field by the sweat of your face. You shall eat bread until you return to the ground, because from it you were taken, for you are dust, and you shall return to dust." So the, the ground is going to be cursed. Now there's thorns and thistles. Now he has to work the land to bring his food out. Yes, the land will produce food for him, but he's going to have to labor hard. And any farmer who tells you life is easy, don't buy anything they're selling. <laughs> because we know every farmer will tell you it's a hard life. It may be a good life, but it is a hard life. The vegetable kingdom, the earth, had the curse put on it from sin also. Look with me at Romans chapter 8. Romans 8. <clears throat> Romans chapter 8. We're going to look at verse 19, and then we're going to do 21 and 22. 
Verse 19 tells us, For the eagerly awaiting creation waits for the revealing of the sons and daughters of God. Creation's waiting for something, is eager for it. Verse 21, that the creation itself also will be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. Creation corrupts. Creation is where, now we know that, that this earth is is losing, not gaining, that in time it would, well, dissolve is the wrong word, but it, it's, it's not getting better. It's the opposite of evolution. Evolution says it gets better and better and better. Well, you look at this earth, and the earth itself is not getting better, better, and better. And some will say, well, that's man's fault, even apart from man. It's under this curse. It's under the, this slavery to corruption. It's groaning and moaning to be free, to, to move in the glory of the God who's given it to his children. Creation will also know that freedom. Verse 22 says, We know the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth. Any of you given childbirth? <laughs> Those pains hurt. Okay? Together until now. And not only that, but also we ourselves, having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, <clears throat> waiting eagerly for our adoptions as sons and daughters, the redemption of our body. And I hear my mom saying, Oh, I can't wait till I have my new body. That's well, right. she's got it. Or she's I got a temporary. Pam says it all the time. We all, those aches and, and, and those joint creaks and, and whatever you're living with, the feet that hurt, <laughs> we all want our new bodies that won't hurt. But creation is feeling it with us. And they also will be released from this curse. Let's look again at where we see them released in our original covenant, Isaiah 55. Isaiah lets them know they're going to be able to rejoice. Isaiah 55, verse 12 and 13, I think we'll look at. And I love this. There's even a song, good Jewish tune to this. For you will go out with joy, be led in peace. The mountains and the hills, remember the hill of the Lord is the, the top hill, but the mountains and the hills will break into shouts of joy before you. All the trees of the field will clap their hands. That's joy. It is personification, but I believe that creation is going to come alive in a way that we don't know today so that they can rejoice, so that they can break out in shouts. We hear it in some ways. We know right now it says creation's in a minor note, and that's the groaning and the moaning. Well, when it's released from that minor, it gets to go into the, the major, the beautiful notes. What about the alien, the, however you say, that harp, that, that when the wind moves through that harp just out in the open, the music that comes out of it, they say it's so gorgeous. Where's that music coming from? It's the wind moving through. That's under this curse. What's it going to be like when the Spirit of God, the wind of God, is able to, to freely move through His creation? Wow. Even all of this earth will get to enjoy that. Go on and read in chapter 35, verses 1 and 2, and, and the latter half of, verses, of verse 6 and verse 7. Read 41 of Isaiah also. 18 to 20. And then Hezekiel comes in again in chapter 36, verse 25. And you've already been, uh, I've told you Joel 2, 21 to 27. You'll see it for the vegetable kingdom there also. What about the animals? Our little precious animals that we love right now. What about the animal kingdom? Isaiah 65 and verse 25 tells us. Isaiah 65 and verse 25. The wolf and the lamb will graze together. The lion will eat straw like the ox, and the dust will be the serpent's food. We talked about it last week, and yes, my poster up there shows our lion and our lamb together, although those are pictures of the Lord. But still, the lion will lay with the lamb and not have the lamb lying in the lion's stomach. <laughs> That's gone. <laughs> they will live in peace together. Um, you can also look at Isaiah 11, verses 6 to 9 for the animals, and Ezekiel chapter 34, 25, and 28. Now, will let our me, animals here be in the millennium? I, I believe there will be the animals here on earth in the millennium, yes. Yes, I believe there will be, even as there are now. There's no reason to believe that God would do away with them. He even brought them to Adam and Eve in the garden, well, to Adam, sorry, to mm -hmm. enjoy 
you know, and to yeah. see his need for a partner also. But he brought them to the garden. Why would he not bring them into the millennium? Uh, God loves his animals. So, And if you've got the wolf and you've got the lion, you've got the ox, you've got the serpent, you know. And the horse, too. Jesus back on but that's oh, heaven. They're yeah, talking. Oh, yeah. But I think they'll give birth on this earth and continue on to the animal life. Because yeah. the curse is removed, okay? Yeah. Let's look at the healing of that body. Isaiah chapter 29. Isaiah 29 and verse 18. Mm-hmm. Isaiah 29 verse 18. The bodies are healed. On that day, Pam... On that day, those who are deaf will hear words of a book. <laughs> She's not deaf, but she has she struggles with the hearing. Yeah. Nobody's going to struggle like Pam. They're going to be able to hear. The deaf will hear. Out of their gloom and darkness, the eyes of those who are blind will see. Isn't that beautiful? The deaf will hear. The blind will see. I, I feel so badly for anyone who has lost either of those senses because I think what they're missing, the, the, the sound, they don't hear the, the joyful glee, the, the happy laughter. Yeah, it's nice they don't hear the tears, but they, you know, they miss the, the good. And to not see what God, I have my hats off to Fanny Crosby, bless her heart, had the right attitude, blind from birth. And when someone said to her how bad they felt for her, her response was, ah, honey. The first thing I will ever see is my Savior's face. Don't feel sorry for me. <laughs> what an attitude. And she, she had a sense of humor to go with her attitude. Uh, of the Lord blessed her special in other ways. The healing is there. Chapter 33, verse 24. Chapter 33, verse 24. Since we're right there, just flip over a couple pages. Isaiah 33 and verse 24 says, No resident, no inhabitant, no one living on this earth will say, I am sick. The people who live there will be forgiven the wrongdoing. They're not going to deal with sickness. The deformities are gone. Um, um, Well, 35 is right next door. So go to to 35 verses 5 and the start of verse 6. For my sword has drunk its fill in heaven. Behold, it shall descend for judgment upon Edom. I'm in the wrong. Oh, okay, okay. The the sword and the judgment's all going away. Verse 6, the sword of the Lord. Well, that's still, that's still, that's the sacrifice. I'm in the wrong. I gave you a wrong reference there. Take that one back. Oh, I'm in 34. That's my problem. My tablet and I didn't get along. Isaiah 35, verses 5 and 6, first part. Here we go. The eyes of those who are blind will be open, the ears of the deaf will be unstopped. Those who limp will leap like a deer, and the tongue of those who cannot speak will shout for joy. For waters will burst forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. Do you see the beauty? Do you catch this? This is gorgeous. This is wonderful. And here is our longevity of life, because I'm telling you, they don't have to die. They can live out the time. Stay in Isaiah. Go back to chapter 25. Chapter 25, you're at 35, back up to chapter 25 and verse 8. Chapter 25 and verse 8 says, He will swallow up death for all time. No one has to die anymore. The Lord God will wipe tears away from all faces. He will remove the disgrace of his people from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. Okay, so he's doing away with death. He's swallowing up death. We know death is not completely gone until we get to the second um, resurrection where they're thrown into the lake of fire for the eternity. Then it says that death is no more from that point forward. So we still know death can happen here. It is a result of disobedience. Um, I think we might see that in, the, in this next Yes, so let's go jump to verse, uh, sorry, chapter 65 now of Isaiah. Go from 25 to 65. In chapter 65, verses 18 to 20, we see, Be glad and rejoice forever in what I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem for rejoicing, her people for gladness. I will also rejoice in Jerusalem and be glad in my people. There will no longer be heard in her the voice of weeping and the sound of crying. No longer will there be an infant who lives only a few days or an old person who does not live out his days. For the youth will die at the age of a hundred 
The one who does not reach the age of 100 will th be thought accursed. If you don't make it out of your childhood, you were accursed from God for some reason. You know, you did something that caused the curse to come on you. Otherwise, you're still going to be like a young child at 100. Can you imagine a 100-year-old? Think of Lorna's mom. Can you imagine her skipping and leaping and jumping and singing and praising God? Well, they'll do that at 100, and they'll do that at 1,000. I can't imagine it on either end right now. But that's what is coming. The infant the infant mortality will happen no more. You won't have um, a child die or, you know, the, in childbirth is what I'm trying to say. Um, and again, they can live out the whole time. Zechariah, Zechariah chapter 8 and verse 4 gives us the idea of how they age though. If there is aging going on. It's not that they stay a child for the thousand years. Zechariah, <coughs> Zechariah chapter 8 and verse 4 says, The Lord of Har Army says this, Old men and old women, so they will age. They will be old, okay? They will again sit in the public squares. I'm trying to hurry. The public squares of Jerusalem. Each person with his staff in his hand because of age. So you'll see elderly who have a cane, who, who walk a little more carefully, you know, because the curse isn't completely gone yet. So you will see age still in there, but they can live out. They're not going to fall down and die, okay? Um, and no war for the thousand years. I think this is my last point. Oh, i got to distribute the land. I'm not going to get as far as I wanted today. I'm sorry. I really wanted to. I'll have to remind you next week. I tried to hurry. We're supposed to live to 120, but nobody's ever made it there. <laughs> <laughs> That's what the rabbis tell us, 120. Okay, Isaiah 2 and verse 4. Um, I've read similar to this. He will judge between the nations, mediate for many peoples. They will beat their swords into plowshares, spears into pruning knives. Nation will not lift up sword against nation. Never again will they learn war. A thousand years of peace. A thousand years of shalom. Hard to fathom, hard to imagine because this earth has never known peace like that. It's never known a length of time. Um, let me show you also, again, no armaments, no military, no military budget, no military personnel, all that gone. Um, and let me show you from Tehillim, from Psalm 46. Um, this is a description in the millennial time also, and I love this psalm. It's a beautiful psalm. Psalm 46 and verse 9 tells us, he makes wars to cease to the end of the earth. All the way to the ends of the earth, there's no wars. He breaks the bow and cuts the spear in two. He takes the bow and he breaks it over his knee. He takes the spear and he just breaks it in two. No weapons of war, nothing. So verse 9 tells us that, that there's no war. We know that to be millennial time. Now just look real quickly at verses 5 and on. God's in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. The nations, I'm sorry, God will help her when morning dawns. The nations made an uproar. The kingdoms tottered. That's what we're living with now. The nations coming against God's plan. The kingdoms will totter in the tribulation. He raised his voice and the earth quaked. The Lord of armies is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. See, God's going to bring them through. And then they come into this, this beautiful time. The works of the Lord, verse 8 says, who has inflicted horrific events on the earth. That's a good description of the tribulation. Horrific events. But the one who brought those horrific events, judgment, God, he makes the wars to cease, what I just read. And when all that stops, and also in the chariots, the, the um, that would be like our tanks, they're burned with fire. And then God says, stop striving. Stop worrying. Know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted on the earth. The Lord of armies is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. I give that to you to encourage you today. Whatever your battle, stop worrying. The Lord who is going to put an end to war. The Lord is going to come and rule and reign on this earth. The Lord who has made these promises, he will do it. Whatever you're facing, he'll take care of it. Go into it with him, not with fear. And he will take care of it for you. Again, I really thought I'd get into the, the description. Next week we will start, we'll see the, the land divided for the 12 tribes. That's, that does not take long, okay? Because uh, I'm not going to go through every single tribe. You can read the verses on your own. But we'll just see Israel belongs to the Jewish tribes. 
not to other tribes. I'm being politically correct here. <laughs> and not to other peoples. Israel belongs to the, the Jewish 12 tribes of Israel. They will receive what they should have received and kept all the way back had they not turned in rebellion to their God. And once we've done that one point, which is short and quick, then we will look at the Millennial Temple. We'll see the size of the Millennial Temple. We will see where the Millennial Temple is. It's very interesting when you see geographically where it is. I'll bring out a little tidbit there. At least I find it very interesting. We're going to look at what's missing in the, in the Millennial Temple. Did you catch that? Something's missing. What's missing? I'll give you a hint. It's more than one thing. In the Millennial Temple. You can think on that for a week and see. We'll see where different peoples go. We'll see the purpose of the temple. Why is there a Millennial Temple? And we've already talked about that there are sacrifices again. And we'll hit on that harder and, and with verses to back it up. Why are there sacrifices? This is a millennium. Why is it there? We will see a river of water. We will see it starts shallow. Hello, kitty. We see that it gets very deep. What does that mean? How does that relate to the people who are living? Is there a spiritual lesson in that even for us? So we'll look at the water. We'll look at the purpose of the sacrifices. We'll look at the temple, where it is geographically. We'll look at what's not in the temple. And then we'll look at what feasts are going to be kept because there will be feasts kept. And I'm talking the Jewish holy feasts. We'll look at which feasts are mentioned that are kept during the millennium. And we'll answer the question, does that mean only those feasts or not? Next week, we'll give you the answer. Okay? So M-E-A-S-T-S. Feasts. -E 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 oh, the holy days. Not the feet. <laughs> <laughs> Pam's hearing feet. She needs her new ears. <laughs> the holy, you know how there's seven major festivals, feasts on oh, the feast. calendar. Okay, we've got um, Sukkot, we've got Shavuot, we've got um, Passover, we've got, you know, I'm, I'm trying to think fast, but we've got seven major ones on the Jewish calendar in a year that the Jews were to keep. What ones are mentioned that they'll be doing in the millennium? What ones are not mentioned? Does that mean that we're not going to see those done? If not, why not? Or does it mean that they will be done? We'll look at, we'll, look, we'll see how much we can answer, okay? okay? But yeah, it's the feasts, <laughs> F-E-A-S-T-S, -E the feasts, so the holy days. I can't pick up stuff. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> you will get those New Year's, Pam, I promise you. <laughs> um, if we get through all of that, we'll look at the earthly Jerusalem versus the new Jerusalem, because both of those are during this time also. And then we take a flying leap into one more... Ugh, moment of battle and then we look at the last judgment and we fly into eternity future so a couple more classes i think we'll finish i keep saying that i know but it takes me longer than i think i'm sorry i'm a very bad judge <laughs> god won't put me in judgment of time <laughs> in the millennium i guarantee you that he's gonna let me throw the clock out of my life forever i guarantee you and by the way i have asked for my assignment if I get my desire of my heart, I will be leading tours through that beautiful land of Israel. Come join my tour. See Israel like you've never seen it before if you've gone. And if you've never made it, it'll be my joy to take you through and show you the beauty of that land. So we'll see. We'll find out one day. <laughs> anyway, um, I'm going to close in prayer real quick because we are so late. Then I'll open it up to questions, discussion, whatever. But I hope it's been a blessing. When you see how wonderful this millennium is, when you see how gorgeous the earth is, when you see the joy that is here, that's still earthly. That's still the capacity that a human has to enjoy. We, we're heavenly. That where our citizenship is in heaven. We have new bodies that can contain so much more that won't explode. We can see the glory of the Lord and not have it blind us. We can hear the choirs of heaven and join them praising the Lord forever and ever. We won't feel the inadequacy we feel now where I think, oh Lord, I just, I can't even scrape the surface to get started. I, I, I'm preschool and I want to be in 
university, <laughs> we will enjoy everything. I mean, we talked about eating today. That's nothing compared to the joys of heaven. That's our, our heavenly abode forever, forever, forever. And I've just started. It's the end of the beginning. <laughs> I've just started. Wow. Our future is so bright, we got to wear sunglasses. <laughs> Let's pray. Lord God, hallelujah. You are amazing and awesome, and we praise you even now. We want to praise you forever and ever and ever. Let your praise continually be on our lips. Lord, let us go into whatever trials and tribulations that we experience now with the joy of knowing this serves to conform us to your image, that this is not to destroy us, but to bring us closer to you. Let us know the joy of it being temporary because forever we will not have this. But Lord, let us learn from it, grow in it, please you in it, and glorify you in it because this is our only time and chance to do that. We want to serve you here and now. Give us the power to do it, Lord. And then thank you. Oh, too little, but thank you for the glories that are ours forever. Lord, just to sit at your feet, just to drink that in. Oh, we'll praise you. Thank you. Hallelujah. In your name, amen. 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 Whew. Wow, what's coming. All right. Roger, open up the mic.